overview of the power system for Orasat. And I think we will be back for Andrew. And our next presentation will be around Orasat firmware and the software architecture. So back to you, Andrew. So this will be a short presentation, so you'll have lots of time for questions and moving on. Um, so the, uh, uh, the the software and firmware people made me do this, so I'm, I'm way out of my league, so forgive me. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit more in depth about the firmware and software that we're running. Uh, just to review, uh, again, we have the three levels of computation on board ORSAT. We have the distributed M0s, we have on a 1U, we've got uh, six of those. Uh, and then we've got the single M, uh, Cortex M4F uh, running the onboard computer. And then the mission processors like the GPS and the Star Tracker run at Cortex A8. Um, so again, the, as you'd imagine, everything's based on CAN, right? We use CAN as the communication bus. And the, if you don't know CAN, I won't go into it, but it's a one megabit per second serial bus with prioritized multi-master connection, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and we use it because, um, and, and this is actually, this is a whole talk into itself. Why do we choose CAN? We didn't want to. We use we use CAN on, on previous rockets and 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 for reasons we hated it. So we switched to Ethernet and we love Ethernet. Ethernet is an amazing bus. Um, and it's it's very friendly for software and of course, you know, modularity. The problem, of course, is it's really, really power hungry and it's too power hungry. It's easily it's easy to power a rocket for 10 minutes. It's hard to power a satellite for <laughs> forever. <laughs> so we had to cry and give up Ethernet and switch back to CAN, which is more power efficient. So we did that. And then, of course, we wanted the standard on top of that, so we chose CAN Open. There's some impedance mismatch between um, a student project and CAN Open, as those who know CAN Open know. Um, it's it's a pretty heavy protocol to some extent, and uh, it's complicated, and it's a, it's a weird way to think about things. So CAN Open uh, grows from OSI layer three to seven. Uh, it's used in industrial automation, and it's really good for that. We question whether it's the right protocol for a CubeSat, but it is, and it's, you know, ESA says it is, and so, so can open it is. Um, the thing to remember with can open is that uh, not only does it describe the messages, but the messages exist like a blackboard, if you will, or a data structure in each of the nodes. And so the, when you think about, you know, it's not just communication protocol, it's really a data definition protocol and each node defines its data and then shares that definition through electronic data sheets and whatnot with other nodes. So when you're, when, you know, when you're writing the battery temperature value, you're writing it to the can open node structure or the can open structure. In this, our, our case, we use can open node, which is an open source library that implements can open. Uh, and it's great because can open node runs on the Linux boxes and on the 32-bit uh, microcontrollers. It's, it's, it's very lightweight and very flexible. Um, then again, one more thing about can open these electronic data sheets are all XML and it's very, you can't, you don't want to hand edit it. So there's one of the huge, huge, I think important tools uh, is a really good can open at EDS editor. Um, and so that's a good open source project to, to really move forward on there. What one exists, I think it's called can open editor or EDS editor and it's, it's, hard to use and so that that would be a great project so let's talk about the firmware a little bit um so again we we have a kind of an upgrade path if you will you start off with a, a off-the-shelf development board move to a proto card that you can you know build yourself and 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 hack to death and then you move on and run your code on the actual card itself um and the firmware is nothing special right it's a gcc uh, plus open OCD, and we use the, since we're using ST32s, STM32s, we use the uh, ST-Link 3, version 3s, I think they are, the little teeny tiny uh, uh, JTAG debuggers. And we use GDB, and, and you know, we have make targets for make write to program the flash and make GDB to, to uh, go through GDB when we're debugging. And again, all that through that, that uh, flat, flexible cable interface. Um, we have a really interesting way of doing the firmware. We don't have a firmware repo per project. We have a single firmware repo, uh, which has gotten us into a trouble a couple times. And then we use branches for development on each thing. Um, the C3 uh, onboard computer, which is an M4F, it shares the same repo as the M0s for the solar and the battery and whatnot. And uh, the 
both run ChibiOS. So we've got ChibiOS as a uh, external submodule and can open node as an external submodule. And thus the M4 requires a file system for the 16 gigabyte EMMC. And that is little FS, which is a great tiny little uh, embedded file system. So we can do over the air firmware updates. So we have uh, L band uplink and a UHF downlink. Um, actually, we have UHF uplink as well. And we, we can uh, send files up using CCSDS protocols, not yet FDP. So uh, we're excited about the LibreCube thing. Uh, so we've got our own terrible little protocol until we finally, uh, finally implement FDP. Uh, and that file stored on the EMMC, and then the uh, C3 can grab that image uh, on a uh, USLP command and program its own flash. Uh, we have two flash banks on that STM, and so we can switch back and forth. Right now, we're looking forward to the, over the, the first over-the-air firmware update, which will have more ability to switch back and forth between banks. And then finally, the M0s have a built-in CAN bootloader, which is part of our firmware repo, and we're very proud of it. It actually mimics a hardware CAN bootloader that's built into the STM. So as we upgrade those STM chips we, that do have the, the um, hardware bootloader over CAN, it'll just work seamlessly. But right now, this is a software bootloader that just mimics that hardware bootloader. Um, right now, we don't have the functionality for the M4 to program the M0s over the CAN bootloader. That's the next uh, over the firmware update. So just like every good open source CubeSat project, we uh, have shipped it with only the bare minimum functionality. <laughs> oh, it's painful. Uh, software. So let's talk about the, the software that's running on the Cortex-A8 boards. So again, we have two levels of tools. We have the... Um, commercial off-the-shelf uh, development kit you can buy for $35. And then we have the actual boards themselves. Um, and Pocket Beagle is amazing. Uh, it's from beagleboard.beaglebone.org. And they come up with a bunch of kits uh, and software infrastructure tools that we uh, use a lot. So on each of our uh, A8 cards, we have this sort of architecture. We've got, um, obviously, Linux. And on Linux, we have something, what we call the ORSAT Linux Manager. O OLM. OLM interfaces uh, that cards to the Canvas, and it runs the ORSAT Linux updater, which allows us to update the uh, Linux, the local Linux distribution. And then it also interfaces directly with uh, whatever uh, card application is running. And so this is really the OLM start, uh, the OLM is really the interface to the rest of the, the application. So we uh, build our own Linux images. Uh, it's just easier because we've got some custom stuff that we do. We use the BeagleBoards image builder to do that. And, you know, we generate a, a custom image for each of our cards that's all posted. And you can get much better information about uh, this whole software system using Read the Docs, which we posted, and it's a, a really great system. Oh, and of course, we burn these images directly to the EMMC Despite the fact that each each uh, A8 card has a micro SD card as a backup, we don't want to fly on the micro SD card. Of course, we fly right off the EMMC. So the Linux updater uh, is a pretty neat little custom solution that we have because we knew we were going to be limited both on the uh, file upload side on the radio link and on the CAN bus. So we create these updater files, which is a tar file that's got the .deb file. Again, we're based on Debian Bullseye. So we use deb files to uh, update the software, as well as bash scripts to run those deb files. The, all the output from that is put into a status file um, that then gets transmitted back down so we know how the update went. And uh, it also gives us a full uh, versioning of all the Debian packages on board. So it makes a large pile of <laughs> output messages, but now at least we know what's happening on board that particular card. So we use uh, a, we wrote our own program called Update Maker, which takes the dev packages and uh, whatever else we've got to update, and using a CLI creates this uh, tar file essentially. And then on board the card, we've got the uh, Linux updater, and that actually uh, runs a Python daemon. And by the way, the ORSAT Linux manager is also everything's a daemon basically, um, and the the up, the Linux updater actually uh, runs through the the um, Bash script and in the uh, our file archive and uh, runs everything. 
and of course generates the output files. So OLM is the basis for everything. It's a C-based da daemon uh, that is our front end to the CAN bus. Uh, it's started by systemd and uh, as you'd imagine and uh, basically really is it abstracts away the CAN bus from the application layer which is really important because a lot of the application layers are pretty complicated. They're their own huge software infrastructure project. Anything we can do to kind of abstract away the, the, the details of the satellite for them would be great. And it also acts as sort of a monitor for each of the Linux boxes and transmits what's going on in terms of CPU usage and RAM usage and the percentage of the EMMC being used. So we uh, really like the Octable chips. They're based on the Satara at AT335X, I believe it is. And the, they come with this thing called a PRU, a Programmable Real-Time Unit, which is a single instruction per clock, 200 megahertz deterministic processor, which is kind of weird, but it's amazing because it allows us to write our own custom FPGA-like uh, interfaces to our local hardware. So we call it PRU CAM because it, in our case, we talk to the AR0134 image sensors, to a shortwave infrared uh, uh, star tracker, and sorry, not star tracker, a shortwave infrared camera that we're using for a climate science mission. And we we'll even use it for uh, talking to the software defined radio GPS receiver, which has a very weird four bit parallel data stream coming out. And we can program a custom, basically, protocol uh, interface for each of those different peripherals. So, like we mentioned before, uh, the everything talks through this FFC connector. Um, we can talk JTAG and we can talk uh, USB and the USB when you plug it in, it can either be a, a serial port or it can be a USB uh, ethernet port. So super easy to debug. Uh, on the outside of the satellite, we actually have a debug port that talks uh, serial directly to the C3 so we can send it commands. So ChibiOS gives us a command line interface shell actually, which is amazing. And we can talk directly to it as well as can be bus and shut down. And again, we, we saw the flats out before, that's how we do all of our software in, integration testing. And finally, uh, wrap up with can open monitor, which is a NCURSS based display of can open messages. And this is great because we can see what's going on in the bus, we can see heartbeat messages, we can see which nodes are up and running. Um, and you just plug in the EDS and DCF from can open and it decodes the messages on the fly for you. That's another open source project, which we highly recommend because we haven't seen anything else that, that does the same thing. And that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. That was uh, really nice and exactly on time. So thank you for that, too. Um, uh, yeah, there have been a few questions on the chat, but I think that those were already answered here. Um, here's another question. We can see you're using F0 and a 4 and a 8 and you know being from a systems perspective like having a, such a um, um, diversity and heterogeneity right of the processor might be challenging. Like how, how did this work out for you and would you recommend it or do it again? Uh, mm, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we made all the right decisions. None of our decisions were terrible. Uh, yeah, yeah I, so th that's a really interesting question. For the, we, we like the F-Zeros. I think the F-Zeros were a win. Um, and the distributed F-Zeros, you talking over can open, I think are simple enough for a student group to deal with. The C3 is too complicated for a single student group and is hard. And, and we all know that embedded systems engineering is hard. So one of the things we might have done, and we may do in the future, is move our onboard computer from an M4 to an A8. Because being able to run Linux as, this, as the onboard computer would enable A, more CS uh, students to participate, and B, allow a little bit more heavyweight threading and processes and modularity in the code. And be able to, again, that modularity is key, right? We all have these giant, complicated, interdependent systems, and it is so hard to debug. That M4 is very hard to debug, and, and RF is hard to debug. So whatever you can do to break that apart and modularize it is really important. And it may be that in the future we move from the M4 to the A8 specifically for the flexibility and debug problem, uh, capabilities of Linux. 
despite the difference in power consumption, right? Like, you think that this, this is still tipping the scale uh, that the debug advantages? We'll, we'll make the, the electrical engineering kids cry by, by running an <laughs> AA. Uh, but, you know, they do have low power modes and uh, they don't have to be on all the time. So it, it's not terrible. It's pushing it for, we, we, the reason we didn't do that in the first place is it's pushing it for a 1U. Uh, it's not pushing it for a 2 or 3U. But uh, a one U, it, it's a little dicey to run that A8 all the time. So mm -hmm. maybe one of the things that we'll look at in the future is some kind of hybrid architecture. I know that Octavo now has a Cortex M7 that runs, or I think it's an M. Actually, I don't, I don't know what it is. Sorry, uh, that run that is the hybrid architecture where there's a local low power and a high power Linux box, and they work together. And it may be, that may be more complicated than we can handle, but it may be where we can shut down the big thing, have a little thing work for a while, and then, you know, power cycle the, the larger processor, that hybrid architecture. Cool. And um, if uh, there is a, a question here in the chat um, about, uh, do you have a power consumption record per OTA update? No, we don't. Um, that we don't expect um, over the updates to take that much power. We're always in receive mode and it takes very little power. I think it's like, uh, let me calculate that. That's about 30 milliwatts, I believe, of continuous power to receive. So receiving is not hard. And then again, we've got that local 16 gigabyte cache um, where we just dump all the data we receive from the ground. And then we don't have to wake up the thing that we're updating until we're, we've got the whole packet and we're ready to update it. And then a, a final question would be about, um, th there's been a lot of um, uh, comments about can open, like through your talks, <laughs> and, and the yeah. choice of can, and, and specifically can open, right? So we, with all its shortcomings, um, you know, and possibly the lack of alternatives to, to, to some extent, right? Um, that, that's I mean, exactly yeah, that's... Um, someone just told us about can-ts for the first time uh, a couple days ago. I, I've not heard about that, but that's apparently a more lightweight version of, of CanOpen. But I, I almost don't trust it. Uh, CanOpen is so well supported and so out there and such a well-defined, to some extent, uh, protocol that it just makes sense, despite the fact that it, it's, it's heavyweight and it's hard to teach and it's counterintuitive in how it uses the CAN bus and everything. It, I still don't see an, an alternative to can open. Uh, I wish there was one, and maybe can TS is one. I, I've not seen it. And uh, I can see I just here on the chat um, uh, questioning uh, uh, the selection whether you have considered you have can so UAV can. No, we've never heard of it. So we'll go look. Thank you. It's well supported and and prolific right now on a, on a different domain, which is the UAVs. But um, there's lots of similarities, obviously, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's actually that that's great. We we one of the things that we try and do is steal as much as possible from people who have the same problems that we do. So UAV can might be will be super interesting to look at. Cool. And uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank once again Andrew and the whole team of Orasat for this lovely session that we have. Uh, and there's a few more Orasat um, uh, talks tomorrow, um, so uh, be on the lookout for that. And with that, I think that uh, yeah, that concludes our session for now, and we can jump into the next break. So, thank you once again, Andrew. Thank you, guys. I really, really appreciate thank it. Thank you. This is fantastic, and we're happy to be here.